Hello, everyone. I'm John Evans, and welcome to another episode of One on One. The WB Network launched a television show 20 years ago this year called Dawson's Creek. Matlock had ended its run shooting here in Wilmington a few years earlier, so Dawson's really was a big deal for the city and its film community, and it's still very popular in many countries around the world. The show launched the careers of James Vanderbeek and Katie Holmes and Michelle Williams, but it also gave a young North Carolina native, Nina Rapetta, her biggest acting role to date. Nina played Bessie Potter. Bessie was the older sister of Katie Holmes' character, Joey Potter. Nina has made Wilmington, North Carolina her home. She was in all six seasons of Dawson's Creek. She later became the North Carolina Azalea Festival queen. She's grown her singing career during her time here, and now she is mom to a nine-year-old who also has a bit of the acting bug. Banks has been auditioning a lot. He was a regular on the TV show Manhunt, the Unabomber. So it's not really about me, John. It's, it's about not. my nine-year-old son. Mm-hmm. When did he get the urge to go into it? It was kind of, it was bizarre. I got cast in a commercial where I had a kid on the show, and something happened, so my agent called and said, look, the kid can't do the shoot. Would Banks be interested in doing the shoot? So I, so I asked him, I said, do you want to go with, do you want to go to work with Mommy? He'd spent on the set with Mike before. Mm -hmm. He said, sure. And I said, well, actually, you're, uh, you're going to be working. He goes, what do I have to do? I go, you're going to be acting. He said, what do I have to do? I said, well, you're going to be my, my kid. And he said, hold up. Are there any cuddling scenes? Because <laughs> I don't do cuddling scenes. <laughs> and how long ago was this? This was three years ago. And so wow. he's been working pretty steady ever since. Is that why you were just in Atlanta for his stuff? Yes. So Now, yeah. as somebody who has done acting and as somebody who has performed, any thoughts about not wanting to rush him or push him into the into the industry at all he is very articulate and he um there have been auditions especially for kids right now that are bent on the evil side of life like devilish if you will yeah and uh so we had one audition that that he studied and learned for and um and then he said you know i don't want to do this part i was like you don't have to do the part and then a couple auditions later, he made a big announcement. He stood on the kitchen bar stool and he said, I have an announcement. Call my agent. I can do vampires. I can do ghosts. I can do yetis. But I will not do anything about the devil or talking baby dolls or clowns. So. Okay, then. Yeah, there you go. He just said his piece. He said his piece. So. Any hesitation, though, with you? Because of, you know, the years that you've seen and the, and the good and the bad that have happened, maybe with some children getting into the industry at a young age? I think that, um, I think Banks is, is really articulate. And I think that I'm, I'm not going to push him. And, of course, I think about that. And, of course, I want to protect him. Sure. Everything bad. I think every parent does. But um, I think he's pretty smart. And uh, there are rules and laws set up now to protect the kids. In fact, it's harder for children. If it's a school year, he has to still go to school on the set. Mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah, I, I, um, I think it's going to be okay. Is it kind of cool, though, to see him kind of follow in <laughs> mommy's uh, footsteps? It is. I, I mean, every parent would be proud. Oh, yeah, yeah. And he's, uh, he's, a good, he's a good kid with a good head on his shoulders. So we'll see. Yeah. You know, because there's no guarantees either. Um, growing up in Shelby, North Carolina, what was uh, a young Nina like? When did you get the bug to want to perform? And, and was it early on? Was it high school? Um, there is a family story. I'm the youngest. I'm the only girl. I'm the last grandchild on both sides. I'm born on my mother's birthday. Um, there is a family story about the family being at a planetarium, and I was three. And when the planetarium became very dark and the stars illuminated the ceiling, I did my version of Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, and it brought the house down, <laughs> and everyone <laughs> cheered and clapped for the little girl who sang. So I've always been singing. It's pretty much all I do, John, is sing and dance and act and laugh and write and cook. 
I'm, I'm and really good be at a mom and be and a mom. Be a husband. I'm really good at having fun. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I do. But uh, so you just knew that the performance in you was born at that point in time. Yes, I think I was lucky. Shelby had this uh, really beautiful facility, the Malcolm Brown Auditorium. So, at a really young age, I started doing theater, lots of theater. I did a musical every year of my life from the age of six all the way through. So I had a strong theater background. And um, and then I went to East Carolina, and mm-hmm. they had a Meisner program there. So I got accepted into the Meisner acting program at East Carolina, where I met my husband. And um, also, that's where Kevin Williamson was at school. Right. And Sandra Bullock. Mm-hmm. And it was, a great, it was a great time where it was a whole, a whole lot of freedom as an artist to explore and do whatever it is that you want to do so and I'm a bit of a dreamer I haven't really sat down and made a goal plan things have just miraculously unfolded I guess yeah but they've gone pretty well I would think take me back to those ECU days Kevin Sandra meeting Mike did you have any idea early on about Kevin did you know him there did you know Sandra there and about meeting Mike uh, give us a, a little bit of a history of the of the two of you well so the history of the two of us there was a there was a theater design class that was a four-hour class and um, you built the sets for the show that was performing at the Messick Auditorium I think theater mm-hmm. anyway um, so that's where I met Mike was in a th- th- scene design class where you build the sets and he really was very full of himself he thought, <laughs> he, thought he was something special um and uh, kevin and and sandra were ahead of me they were a couple years before me so i was just like a little freshman mm-hmm. and they already were um deeply rooted in the theater thing and they were the the people you looked up to at the time and um they're very very deserving for everything that they've worked for and achieved there amazing so Mike did a play with uh, Sandra and Kevin Williamson and I think one of the first rap parties on Dawson's Creek you know typically you bring gifts or whatever so one of the gifts to Kevin was the actual playbill from Chekhov's Three Sisters I believe Mike was in the show wow. with Kevin. <laughs> so I bet that was a neat little flashback. gift for him to get yeah <laughs> How did you, uh, you started concentrating pretty heavily on your music, though, coming right out of ECU, correct? Correct. And what was the thought process? Was it going to be a singing career? Was it going to be uh, singing and acting or just performing? What were, you, what were you thinking at that point? Well, it was interesting because I sang, um, I had a little lounge act when I was in high school with holiday and lounges. It was really kind of funny. <laughs> um, anyhow, uh, I, I I always did music, and then when I went to East Carolina, the music department was not in cahoots with the theater department, so they they demanded you choose one or the other, and because they had the Meisner program, I chose theater, Mm -hmm. so the music thing uh, has always been my love and my passion, I always sang in church, Um, I didn't write my first song until I threw away the music and looked at the keyboard for what it is, you know, so that was... Did that bring you to Wilmington? Oh, I have a story about what brought me to Wilmington. Oh, okay. Well, let's oh, hear that. Oh, this is a good one. So let's hear that. there's a phenomenal, amazing hair designer named Michelle Johnson. And I met this woman in the trunk of my car. Uh-oh. <laughs> there's a there's a big there's a big music festival called the Boogie. And um you have to be invited by someone that's been there years prior. And I was uh singing with a reggae band. Anyway, I had to get snuck into the property where the festival was, and I met this woman in the trunk of my car. And and um, anyway, had a great time, did right. the festival. Then I got cast in my first film while I was still at East Carolina. And that was? The Handmaid's Tale, okay. the right. original hand, yeah. Handmaid's Tale with Faye Dunaway. Okay. And so I show up on set, and who is my hairdresser? Michelle. Okay. And so she says, what are you doing? And uh, I was like, I'm about to graduate East Carolina. I don't know what I'm doing. She said, I bought a house in Wilmington. And at that time, downtown Wilmington, historically, Mm -hmm. was really in a huge change at that time. So she had bought this historic house, huge house. The the room where I lived had six-foot-wide pocket doors that slid into the Mm -hmm. wall. So... um, 
So she said, come live with me. So I did. So that's how I got to Wilmington. And then Mike followed soon after. She tipped him off about a little movie called Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Sure, yeah. So he interviewed for that, and he got on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And then Matlock was here at the time, worked on a bunch of Matlock. Yeah, you did several Matlock episodes, I right? I did, Sarah. I did five episodes of Matlock. And, um, and really, Matlock is how... Uh, uh, there was a director by the name of Leo Penn, it was mm-hmm. Sean Penn's father, mm-hmm. and he cast me in several of those Matlock episodes. And at lunch one day on the set, he was like, Nina, you are in the geographic wrong location to be anything more than a day player. So when you come out to L.A., you give me a call. And so when I went to L.A., I did. And that's how I got funneled in to an agency that allowed my headshot to end up on the desk of Kevin Williamson for the original read for his pilot, Dawson's Creek. Right. Um, you and I have uh, uh, something in common. You were actually on Matlock episodes. I read for one oh, and, yeah. and thought that I was actually going to, it was, they had a, a spinoff with George Pappard. Yes. Uh, where he was going to play some kind of detective and I came in and, and I read for it. And it was for somebody to do just the news, a news break that they were going to hear and react to and then, uh, you know, go on with whatever the episode was going to do. So I was in Wilmington maybe 18 months tops, and I got this opportunity. And so I called my mom and dad and said, look, I read for this. Matlock episode's going to come on. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you got to listen for me. I don't know if I'm actually going to be on, but you got to listen for me doing this. Okay, so good. So everybody back in... Pennsylvania, the small town of 2,500 people, is waiting for it, and I wasn't in it. Oh, no. <laughs> Did you get cut? Somebody voiced it. It wasn't oh. me. <laughs> I'm sorry, Tom. So I, I you know, <laughs> called my parents the next day and said, I don't know what happened, blah, blah, blah. And then I started realizing that, you know, it, it, whatever could happen. But um, Andy Griffith, I, when I showed up there that day, he was, I mean, it was like, at that point, he was an icon. Oh, yes. And, and especially in this town and in this state, was massively still popular at that time. Oh, Matlock. So I can even go back one further. I'm sorry that you got cut. Well, I do know happens. how that feels. Yeah. That's why. Kind of worked out for the best, I guess. Whenever I'm, I'm in an in a episode, I don't tell anybody. <laughs> I usually have been totally by myself to watch it and go, did I get cut? Did I get cut? Um, so... Mike and I both did The Lost Colony. Have you heard of The Lost mm-hmm. Colony? It's yeah. an outdoor drama about yeah. the original colonists that came here from England. Yeah. So did Andy Griffith. And that was a huge connection for... Wow. And Mike Mike also worked on Matlock. Yeah. So Andy, at the time that Matlock was here, you know, he was pretty seasoned. Yeah. I'm not going to say elderly. He was very seasoned. Mm-hmm. But as older people can... B, when you engage them, then the whole world stops and they're oh, yes. just ready to talk. That, and yeah. that's how it was. For oh, that's Andy awesome Griffith. to have that, that really kind awesome. of tie-in. Mm-hmm. And and that really was the big deal at the time. I mean, you had something, Maximum Overdrive and some of the other deals, but Matlock shooting here was really the draw at the time for Wilmington oh, and Screen Movie. right, yeah. right. And then we have, they, we have the whole facility. I think Wilmington was a fine little secret yeah, at that for time, a yes. long time yeah. with the studios and... Um, just the infrastructure we had with our grips and mm-hmm. the lighting and the teams and the crews that we have here are top notch, you know, and I think that was a well kept secret for many years, you know, and, and a nice little point of pride for Wilmington and for yeah. the state of North Carolina. And it drew people here. I mean, people would come to see the Matlock episodes being mm-hmm. shot. Andy Griffith, they'd go to, you know, they'd go to Western North Carolina to go to quote unquote Mayberry. Oh, and right. then they'd come over here to see him actually shoot the Matlock mm-hmm. episodes. So ironically, you were here and then went out to LA and then got the part in oh. Dawson's and ended up coming back to Wilmington. How, is, how good was that? How good was that? It's a God thing. And I have to say that because I don't think any human being could orchestrate and that's that's really how my life has been too so so here's what happened so mike was a camera operator leo penn had said you're not you're not going to do anything more unless you come out to Mm -hmm. los angeles right mike got an offer to work on a show at universal studios in hollywood so so we went we tidied up our house here we flew out to la mike started working on the show at universal studios we found our way around town And I got an agent, so I was going on auditions, and then Mike's show got canned. There are no No guarantees, guarantees. and uh, as you know, even when you're so there are no guarantees. So 
right when Mike's show ended, I was auditioning a lot. So I didn't want to leave. We had a place in Hollywood. It was a total dump. <laughs> it was the only dark place in all of sunny Southern California. Yeah. And uh, But the ladies that ran the place where we lived, they were like, this is the lucky building. So apparently, I guess it was the lucky building. Yeah. But we stayed and I started auditioning. And then we ran out of money. Yeah. So we took the red eye and came home to the house where we still live mm -hmm. in Wilmington. And... Um, and then I got a phone call that said, hey, we want you for this pilot. And they were very regretful to inform me that it, it shoots in Wilmington, North Carolina. <laughs> so what oh, are the, and not only that, one creek over, like the location that was used for the Potter B&B, one creek over. I literally could have taken my boat to work. Yeah. So uh, that, I would say, is the mighty hand yes. of God and not uh, any making of my own. Any thoughts when that all started that it would blossom into what it was for the WB and for all the all the all the careers that it launched and now even 20 years later it is still popular in some parts of this world. You go and oh. still see it running now, massively popular overseas. But even still this year 20 years they had the you know they they had another celebration here in town. Any thoughts when it started? I think that as an artist, which I consider myself an artist I mm -hmm. also paint and there are times where or if I'm writing a song there are times when I write a song and I'm like oh, this is the best ever and then no one else likes it but me mm -hmm. but I will say like that first season there was something so pure that it unfolded before us and I think it wasn't until season two or season three that uh it just blew up I think especially for the stars because I'm not one of the main stars i've played katie's sister mm -hmm. on the show right. but as i watched the fans come forward i remember one time we were shooting um at the uso building second and orange yeah. Yeah. and um it the fans followed us everywhere dawson's creek unlike matlock so much we were like shooting little movies so everywhere we went we were on location and the yeah. fans could find us and they did and and it it just People gathered and gathered, so so we knew it was taking it, it was taking on speed, because the people started showing up, and it used to be a handful, and then there were hundreds, and then we had to have the cops to hold them back, because everyone wanted to be next to the stars. So uh, I think, I think after that first season, we all knew that it was really something big, and it was something different too, because I think uh, Dawson's Creek was a pioneer on what they did with popular music and putting it in yep. with the episodes. And it was also very different the way Kevin Williamson wrote that pilot. And as it continued for the seasons, the kids were the adults. The the language that the the way the scripts were written mm -hmm. made them the more intelligent ones than yeah. the grown ups. Um any I I I wasn't I was working so often that I don't remember actually watching it as it played. But Season one, there was some controversy with your character. Um, did you did you have to um, you know kind of kind of deal with that on a national basis that much? I don't know about a national basis, but um, it's interesting. It's interesting how different things affect different people yeah. and how differences affect different people. But it was a something, not a nothing, you know. Um, you know, having an illegitimate child and uh, being in a biracial couple, right. uh, and and that, and then and then what's interesting as Dawson's Creek kept pushing, then there was the season where the character Jack came out mm -hmm. as being gay. Right. So I think the whole point of that show and why it resonated with so many people is that let's do these things that are actually happening in the world right. and put it out there. So yeah. I. Um, but so yeah. in, in many ways, a trailblazer in many ways, this would be the first one to kind of stick that toe in that pond, as it right, were. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. Did, was there any reflection, any, as you were doing the reads, anybody like, whoa, I don't know how that's going to go over? Or, or were you all kind of charging, let's do this and let's try this? I think we were all charging, let's do this, let's try this. And I think that that, that mentality is what made Dawson's Creek what it was, you know. As an actor... I personally didn't have a lot of say on like the scripts mm -hmm. unfolding. I mean, we would sit down and do table reads and sometimes the writers would sit in and they would go, mm, that didn't come out like I wanted it to, we'll tweak that. Or as a regular series regular on a show, sometimes you would show up and in your trailer or the makeup trailer, 
you would get your new script, you know, right there at the last minute. They've decided to tweak that. Mm -hmm. but, um, what was it as, the, as it started to gain a little more steam and as the Vanderbeeks and the Holmes and the, and, and the Jacksons and some of these were starting to gain some of that notoriety? Was it notable even on the set? Were there changes in people as they were growing older and dealing with some of their, um, some of their notoriety, as it were? Because you were older than you were, obviously a little more mature than a right. lot of these young men. I'm and glad women. you corrected yourself there. I'm a little more yeah. mature. <laughs> a little I mean, more mature. Maybe, maybe, but stuff that you had already dealt with, right. and, and you know, uh, you're seeing them have to go through the same thing. I think that the the four the four stars were amazing human beings from the get go, you know, and I think that anything that came their way as anyone, you know, when something happens really fast like that, I think it's shocking, you know, mm -hmm. and I think either you're going to roll with it or not, you know, so um, I think they did really well and um, they're all four of them are very different. I think I can remember Josh, I can remember that same location, a fan said it's my birthday and Joshua singing happy birthday and getting the whole crowd to do it and, and thinking that's awesome because we're still right. just people, you mm -hmm. know, we're just was there, going to work. You were the older sister of Katie's character. Right. Did you become that kind of person off the set with her at all? Not really. No? No, not really. I mean, we, uh, it's funny because, uh, we would see each, see each other, and the the character that played Dawson's mom, she had a house that was that was a little bit of the gathering space. But um, it's interesting when Katie and I look back at the episodes, the episodes that I'm in, we have a fight, we make up. <laughs> you know, it's a sister relationship, <laughs> right, yeah. but not really. You know, no. not really. I think we're actors at work, and everybody has different they're drawn to different people for different reasons were you happy the way the arc of your character took over that six seasons mm, i don't know i probably would have done it differently but but you were so. in you were there all six uh and, and i'm just kind of wondering uh, you have to deal with again what they write for you right but i'm just wondering what your thought process was like was like ooh, well okay let's deal with this the best we can right uh, I think too. It's um, it's it's funny because I think the character that played my baby daddy, <laughs> mm -hmm. right. he was he was only in a few episodes, and rumor had it that he demanded more money when Dawson's Creek took steam, and then all of a sudden you never see him again. <laughs> <laughs> but he was always in the kitchen, or right. he was always oh, yeah. at work, or we're on the phone now. So I think there's also that idea that it was great to be working. Don't stir the pot, mm -hmm. you know, and, and roll with it. I, I, the level, the level of series regular that I was, I didn't have any kind of like big power to go in there and go, no, 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 let's right. do this. So. It's just, it's just amazing for those of us who, who are on the other side and watching what it was, what it must have been like in that whole atmosphere, because it really was a, a, a huge phenomenon as it grew and as it, as it gained steam, especially for a network that was as young as the oh, WB right. was. Mm -hmm. I know that that really was amazing. I think too, um, being able to shoot in Wilmington and be here and being able to continue the life that Mike and I already lived, sure. being on the water, going spear fishing, going surfing, going to Masonboro and doing those things. We continued to do those things, and that was that was really lovely to be able to take take some actors with us out on the boat and, and go and do what we do. And that's what they did. And I think they all fell in love with this town. And I think if you could sit down and have a podcast with any of those stars. They would say how much they loved living in Wilmington. What are some of your best memories? The people, and and do you have special memories with each one of them, and with I Kevin think. even during that whole shooting, that six seasons. Yes, I do, and I think one of my, this is my all-time favorite. Is I can't remember which episode it was. Um, there was a wedding going on. I can't remember. I think I'm. I think I was catering a wedding. I think I, I can't remember which episode exactly. But as real high school kids would do, they get mad at each other, and they're not mad at each other. And mm -hmm. sometimes I would show up in the makeup trailer and be instructed that no one's talking to so and so today. You know. <laughs> so what ended up happening is we ended up. Uh, toilet paper rolling James's trailer. Oh. Oh, for fun. And it was bad for the transportation 
department, but we, <laughs> I did help them clean it up. But little things like that yeah. were fun, just little tricks and jokes on people and that kind of thing. Fun to watch the way Wilmington grew with Gossens Creek in notoriety during that time too, because you had yes. seen it before it really kind of started. So you had to obviously realize that there were more visitors coming to more watch you at different places and different times. I think what Dawson's Creek and One Tree Hill right after Dawson's Creek, because those fans are are, are just as loyal, if not more so, more so than, than the Dawson's Creek fans. And those fan, that fan base across the board are some of the most dedicated, loyal. I've had people travel from all over the world to come here. And what what those shows did for our town, I don't think any other I don't know of any other location that a TV show has done that for. Right. I it's, really don't. And yeah. I think that uh, I think it's unfortunate for whatever happened on a political realm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm a dreamer and I'm an artist and I, I'm, I love this town. So I'm, I'm hoping it would return. Um, but I think I think what those two shows did for our city is unprecedented. So then you get the phone call in 2000 to become the queen of the Azalea Festival. <laughs> now, you had to have seen Azalea Festivals and attended, but to become the queen, Ooh, that good. must have just been a free and fun ride for that entire time. Okay, so I'm going to tell you the truth. I get the phone call about, will you be the Azalea queen? And I thought it was my friend Denise playing an April Fool's joke on Oh, me. really? You oh, didn't, oh, you didn't believe it? No, I didn't believe oh, it. Oh, I never and heard so that. And so this woman <laughs> says, we're calling to see if you'll be the queen. And I went, oh, yeah? She says, yes. And I said, well, who's playing? And she said, cool in the gang. I, I said, well, I'm going to need 20 tickets. And then the lady said, well, I think we can do that. And I, I go, and I'm going to need a whole bunch of hotel rooms at the Hilton. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think we can do that. And then I went, Denise, and she said, no, this is Paula Lance. <laughs> I'm really asking you to be the Azalea Queen. I went, really? <laughs> You're asking me to be the Queen? <laughs> That's funny because I know Paula because oh. I could only imagine what, what her face was like on the She's other end of the amazing. phone line. amazing. I love Paula. Right? Yes. She's like, what's going on yeah, with her? I, I, and I, I, did, I did end up with all those tickets to the yeah. show. It was phenomenal. You, it, you don't get to keep the crown, though. You know that. Right, I do know that. I know yes, that transfer. It's a heavy crown. And as I looked back on that footage, it was very windy that day. We played that. We played. <laughs> Your getting <laughs> crowned downtown was one of the montage we played when we brought it back for Throwback Thursday ahead of this year. Oh, my word. Uh, yours, Sydney that Penny's, Kelly Rippa's, yes. some of the others. But can anything before that, even thinking about being the queen, can anything match actually going through that three or four days and being treated as royally, literally, as you are? It, I, I, I tell you, the best part of being Azalea Queen is, um, for me, was Alonzo Wilson. Alonzo Wilson is the world's greatest wardrobe designer, and he was on Dawson's Creek. And when they asked me to be the queen, I went to Alonzo and was just like, oh, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna wear? Oh, uh. He's also a Wilmington native. Mm -hmm. He dressed me. And I was written in the newspaper as the best dressed Azalea Queen. And I owe that to Alonzo, to Alonzo Wilson. Because that year they had, what, Cool and the Gang. Casey uh, and the Sunshine Casey Band. Casey and the Sunshine Band and Sinbad. Sinbad was, was amazing. It was the, it was was the concert amazing. that was held yes. out at the airport. airport. That's right. And that was that was a fun, fun <sighs> night of entertainment. That was amazing. I had the best time. Yeah. By the end of it, you're you're simply exhausted. Yeah, it was. And Mike and I were talking about coming in to do this podcast, right. and I thought, you know, John really has the harder job. You guys <laughs> have to like, you know, look good all the time, and yeah. you don't have hair, yeah. and you don't have Alonzo Wilson dressing really? you. I've just got, so. I look in the mirror and I say, that guy's got to put the makeup on. I'm like, man. <laughs> <laughs> what happened there? Um, when you're doing Dawson's and you want to try to get other things, I mean, I know you did Divine Secrets. I know you did some some other work during that time. What's it like to try to branch out and do those kind of things when you still got that commitment to Dawson's all the way around? Do you have to really work around that or, or almost get permission well, to do it? Even to do Azalea Queen was yeah. during the shooting schedule of Dawson's, and the producers were like, what? I was like, well, they've asked me to be the queen. 
I yeah. can't turn that down. Mm -hmm. But it was a it was a something, not a nothing to even do Azalea Queen because it was during the shooting schedule for Dawson's Creek. But while that show was going, um, my mother became very sick, and um, she had this weird thing that no only twelve people on earth had ever had, and it called Bud Chiari syndrome. And so, the only thing that would fix her after going back and forth, Bowman Gray Chapel Hill was a liver transplant. Mm -hmm. And so she received a liver transplant and lived. I mean, she oh, lived. Wow. They said she might live seven years. She lived She lived many, many years. Yeah. Saw the birth of my son and Gosh. many wonderful things. So, so when Dawson's was shooting, there was um, summers that I spent in L.A. Mm -hmm. auditioning. But for the most part, I think fam family for me and, and being there for my mom and, and everyone preparing for her death, no sure. one knew if that would happen. And then her receiving a liver transplant, which was also kind of weird because she and I became uh, like the face for organ doning. And that, that ran its course. And she and I both sat down one day for tea and was like, it's a little weird. I think we've done what we need to do with that. Let's mm -hmm. put that to rest. But. So that happened during during the shooting of Dawson's, but it, it is it is difficult, and that's part of why Mike and I didn't um, we weren't sure we were ever going to have a family, you know, because right. you, it's hard, it's really hard, it's hard to have a marriage, yes. it's hard to, uh, you know, we laugh about it, but when Mike's on a series, it, you have to schedule if you're you can't get sick, and if you do get sick, when are you going to go to the doctor because the shooting schedule is so grueling? Yeah, and 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 even in in media journalism, I've seen I've seen the hours take their tolls on on many many marriages. It's difficult to be that committed to something like that that needs you when they need you. Oh yes, and it's got to be first in many mm -hmm. many ways. And you know, my wife Sheila, you mentioned earlier uh, about we talking about children. And, and I've told people, and I will admit that, 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 you know, my kids are as well off as they are just in their independence because of my wife. I work too many hours. You do work a lot. You know, but you did the same thing. I mean, mm -hmm. you made that commitment early on, and now you're getting to enjoy well, you your You want to know how banks came around? <laughs> Uh-oh. This, this is a clean podcast now. We don't, I don't want to have so, to check okay. a different box. You don't have to check a different box. Okay. So do you remember the writer's strike? Remember yes. Dawson's Creek, right? And then there was a writer's strike, mm -hmm. and there was no work. And so Mike was home, and I was home. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So yes, nothing to do, right. you know. Mm -hmm. And so then things started smelling funny. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was pregnant. So really, it's really the writer strike. We should have named him Writer Strike. There or you something. go. Or yeah, or Striker. Striker. There you go. Striker that could have been S T R Y K E R. Why didn't I do that? Oh, that was a, would have been oh. a great name. When it came out that Dawson's was going to end, what was that like around the set? Because then you had to face something also, are you going to stay here and so on and so right. forth. But what was it like just to bring that whole episode and all the memories with those people to a close? I think that for many, uh, I think for the big stars too, I think that it had, it had run its, it had run its course, you know, and, mm -hmm. um, and it's always bittersweet because no one really knows what's going to happen. So like that last day of shooting, it's like, okay, we are now officially all unemployed. <laughs> yeah. What's going to happen next, you know? And I think for a lot of people, they were ready for a break. Just take a little break. Mm -hmm. So, um, bittersweet would be a single word I would say. Yeah. Or is that two words? No, I mean, tears at the, oh, at the party. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. Yeah. Do you still have relationships with, with all of the people that you dealt with there? Or um, many of them? Some of them, not as tight as I would like to be. Everybody kind of scatters. And mm -hmm. then I have my own personal life and sure. the things I enjoy doing yeah. and as well as everybody else. But there's still uh, contacts throughout the years where we say hello or meet nice. up and you go to L.A. Or when did you make the decision to stay here past Dawson's? Because being here to shoot, obviously, was a lot easier for you and Mike. But when did you say, okay, we're going to base our life out of Wilmington, North Carolina? Well, we based our life out of Wilmington, North Carolina, and then went to L.A., and then it was like, no, go back home. Right, right. <laughs> and um, things, things were really great in this town for many years, mm -hmm. many years. It was really great in this town. And I particularly love the water. So does Mike. Oh, Mike's a great spear fisherman, and I'm a great cook, and... Uh, we live on the water, and it's hard for me to leave this place because of the environment that 
that I get to live in. You know, yeah. it's growing pretty quickly oh, yeah. right now. Yeah, so I don't know how long I'm going to say that. Yeah. But um, but then but then you start to raise a family and, and you know Banks comes along and now he's starting to take over that next maybe next generation of entertainer in the in the family now. Right. Well, he said on the way to school today uh -oh. he was talking about uh, he would be totally okay moving to Atlanta. Oh. So. Uh, yeah. I don't know that I share the same. <laughs> okay, I don't know that I'm okay with that. But um, I, I really, I love this town for where it is, and mm -hmm. I love what I do in my home and, and what I have based here. But the truth of the matter is that film is, uh, film's not really here. Right. It's, it, Georgia has really... <laughs> stepped up. They've stepped yeah. up, you know, yeah. and like a magnet, everything has gone there. So I don't really know what the future holds, but I know we stayed here because we love it. Mm -hmm. We love it here. And it worked out to travel. So I still kept a place in L.A. and I would go there for the summers or come right. back and forth. And you have so. done some stuff. You did good behavior. You did, did last good year. Behavior last um, year. And you did some other things uh, since then, too. But SpongeBob. Yeah. And, um, you know, and then I sing. I sing a lot. And I that's enjoy. I was going to get to that because okay. you've really. I mean, you put out albums. Like the Christmas album you put out, of of the 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 jazzy Christmas mm -hmm. songs that you put out. Mm -hmm. Really, I listened to several of those tracks the other night, and it's just like wow. I never heard, you know, uh, some of the, the the traditional Christmas songs that you hear done in the way that you've done them. It, it really that, is. It really world. is kind of cool. That's kind of cool. I just I, I sing. I sing a lot. I like music. I don't know that I'm such a, a marketer, if you will, but um, uh, I have a jazz trio. We're right. playing Mother's Day Mother's Day brunch at theater now. Plug that. There you go. Um, but that's also the doing the jazz instead of the blues bar scene. The jazz is something that uh, Banks can go to every single show right. that I do. So I really, I guess if I was going to reflect and say, okay, what happened? I'm a mommy, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. But you, how often do you have to maybe turn down singing too many times because of being the mommy aspect? Because I know your love for music You'd like to be out and just perform it. Mm. But you've you also got to balance that mommy thing, and you right. can't be gone too often. Well, and sometimes he just has to pony up and be a good boy and sit there. You know, it's kind of funny to watch <laughs> sure. a nine-year-old singing Satin Doll or, yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> It Had to Be You. But um, it's interesting. That's, that's, a big, that's a big factor when I audition or I, and I get on a high consideration list or I book a job. It's like, okay, well, what do we do with banks? You know, if mm -hmm. Mike's working too. So. Sure. So it's just something, not a nothing. But like you said before, you have to be on the ready. You can't yeah. you can't call them up and say, "Oh, my sitter fell through. I can't yeah. make it." So, do you like performing to a live audience? Because yes. you've cut what yes. four or five different records already. The, uh, three three albums. Three albums are out, and then I have one that's in the making right okay. now okay. with some original music right. and. Um, uh, I do enjoy it. What was the question? I said the live audience versus oh. writing your own and recording your own materials. I've always loved a live audience. There's a, um, and that's interesting because when I started out, like the Matlock, it used to be as an actress, you had to travel yeah. like everywhere. You had, you would get a call from your agent. They want to see you in Charlotte. I'd get on the road. I'd go to Charlotte or I'd go to Atlanta or I would go to New York or down to Louisiana. Now everything is digital. So now... You, we have a studio set up at our house. We film it. We upload it. And that's been a little bit of a change for me because I'd much rather be mm -hmm. in the room. I'd much yeah. rather be in the room. I, I love a live audience. There's nothing that compares to that, in I, my opinion. I know you still do some theater, too. Still do some you theater. You like that? I do. I do. I like that a you lot. You did a now children's should, theater last I, year, didn't you? I did Pied Piper. Pied Piper. Yeah. And Banks, Banks was, was in, in it. Yeah. It was our third year sharing the stage together. That's mm -hmm. got to be, that's got to be a kick. It's so fun. It is. Well, the first one, so, so the first one, I like doing that because that's a feel good performance where yeah. every first and second grader gets to experience mm -hmm. the beautiful historic Thalian Hall. And um, so Banks was with me at rehearsal and he sits next to the director and he says, ah, you know, I know that opening song. <laughs> and I can skip. So he got himself the part the first year. So we <laughs> shared the stage. And then I did a show with Tony Rivenbark at the Cube Theater yeah. uh, last year. So, yeah, he's and I would, I would have loved to have done, I had an opportunity to do another play, but it's very difficult to make that work 
it's it's a lot of work. Live theater is a lot of rehearsals, and then you have to be there for the performance, and it's just too much. You do a lot of volunteering, but I know that Relay for Life is very important to you. Well, I haven't done Relay for Life recently, but um, but uh, I mean you, you I do have yeah. many um, Relay for Life is. Uh, you know, for those with cancer, I've had many, many family members die yeah. of cancer and friends, too. too. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so uh, I did sing for Relay for Life one year. You dug deep, John. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, because that's one thing we have in common. I mean, I okay. did Relay for Life for New Hanover, uh, Brunswick County for a couple of years, Pender County for uh, for a year. Uh, you know, my mom passed away from cancer. My wife's mom and dad, Sheila's a breast cancer survivor. So we get involved in these these. Uh, groups and efforts that are important to us mm -hmm. and I, I I knew that relay for life was important to you and and you've done many many things with it how Maybe, weird is this yeah. how weird is this so today is the actual day that my nephew Max Blanton died from rhabdomyosarcoma he was oh, 10 years old I didn't know that so that was uh that's really interesting you should bring this up today is the eight eight years that uh my my nephew Max passed away. And it was interesting as he was getting chemo. He he was the wittiest, smartest, most most precious nephew. He was so funny. And but as he's getting chemo, you know, you lose your hair. Yeah. yeah. And uh, we were talking, and he was like, Aunt Nina, you know, it's one thing to be completely bald, but when you lose your eyebrows and your eyelashes, you really look like an alien. <laughs> you know. But um, yeah. It taught me. It taught me that I could do things that I never thought I would be able to do, right? A as a caregiver, yes. And and that's one of the things, the stories that I tell is that you know I would never thought that I would have been able to change a bulb syringe or I'd mm. be able to do some of these things as Sheila was going through chemo. And it really gives you, uh, you know, the strength to do some of these things because of what it drives. Right. And I know that it, you've it's touched your family in many many ways too. Many ways. That's that's very very well said. That you can do things that you normally wouldn't do. And I think one of the things that I do is is I try to keep humor, yeah. humor throughout. I mean, mm -hmm. and I think that the other thing that it's done in my life is that to love one another and to uh, celebrate now. Let's don't have a funeral where you drive no. thousands of miles. You no. get you inconvenience yourself now, mm -hmm. and let's have a big party right now. Let's have a dance party. That sounds like a plan. <laughs> yeah. um, I know that your starring role now is mom, mm -hmm. but uh, you said you have another uh, record of material coming out soon? Hopefully soon, yes. There are nine songs, and they kind of don't go together. We don't know what we're going to do with that. But um, It doesn't matter. In this day and age, you can release one, one, a, one, at one a, a month for the next year. <laughs> hey, that's a great idea. Yeah. Maybe you should be my marketing manager. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, I'm just uh, climbing every social media mountain that I can these okay. days and trying to learn the whole thing. But you have, you have been a joy to, to bring in here and, and share some time me, with John. us today. It's so great to see you. It and, is. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. And, and I know that you, uh, you, you love Wilmington. You keep, uh, you keep Wilmington high on the high on your list of places to talk about it is i love this town i want it to uh i'd like it if some more projects came here so yeah. let's well, put that in the universe yeah. let's manifest that that sounds like a plan and Best in the of meantime banks, we'll have a dance party and 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 watch Woo! and watch banks continue to get more and more roles as he climbs the <laughs> yeah, ladder yeah let's right? claim that too thanks, thanks for nina. having me thanks nina bye Big thanks to Nina Rapetta for coming in this week for our conversation. She's still busy doing a lot of singing and some acting as well, and with her family, too. You can keep up with her performing schedule by going to NinaRapetta.com. She also has a lot of videos on YouTube and several albums that you can check out on her website as well. Nina is also the aunt of a young lady named Jessica Blanton. Jessica is engaged to next week's podcast guest. Liberty Anderson of UNC Wilmington. Liberty was just named the CAA Women's Golfer of the Year and just won her second straight CAA Individual Golfing Championship. Quite an accomplishment for a young lady who says moving to Wilmington two years ago literally saved her life. Yeah, it literally saved my life when, uh, when I transferred here and I realized how great this place is and and just like what it what it was able to offer me that that Virginia wasn't able to offer me and what it did for me on an emotional level on a personal level um yeah it it saved my life i i was to put it bluntly i was wanting to kill myself so 
to to move here and to not want to do that you know like i've completely changed state of mind when i got here mm-hmm. and um you know with the help of therapy and things like that sure. but yeah but i really think that it was that change of scenery that that really helped that's liberty anderson right here next week on the podcast. If you know someone who you think would be a good interview for an upcoming episode, please send me an email and let me know about it. Send it to jevans at wect.com. And if you'd be so kind to leave me a rating or a review for this week's episode or any of the other ones that you've listened to, we'd really appreciate it. And if you send me a screenshot by email, you could be the lucky listener we pick out at random. And we'll send you one of those great-looking WECT travel mugs. I'm John Evans. Thanks for joining us for this week's episode of One on One.